in the name of Christ, our Messiah, our Savior, our Redeemer, in the name of Jesus, amen. 100 miles. How long do you think it would take you to walk 100 miles? I don't know if you took your time, if you were burdened down with a backpack, with supplies inside, because remember, while you're walking, there is no 7-Eleven along the way. No Publix, no Target, no Walmart do you pass. And you're on foot. Now let's say 10 days. 10 days to walk 100 miles if you took your time, which undoubtedly you would especially if while you're traveling you're talking to people along the way you're not silent you're not ignoring people that are around you especially when you consider that you're going in you know through little towns along the way and maybe you want to buy a pickled sausage or a coca-cola or a pepsi cola if you know which one is better than the other i make no judgment you're walking you're talking. And what do you think you're saying? Undoubtedly, people are traveling with you. You've got a little crowd, a little group, and you're walking along the way, and maybe you're walking a little slower than some, maybe a little faster than others, and you happen to walk next to somebody. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Where are you going? What are you up to? Well, I am going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ when I get to the town of Thessalonica. That's Paul. That's Silas. And that's Timothy. We finally finished Acts chapter 16 last week. Hooray! We finally got through Acts chapter 16. And in Acts chapter 16, we read all about Paul and Silas and Timothy and Dr. Luke there in the city of... I hear a few people saying it. We spent about, what, four weeks, we all should know. Philippi, I could go back and preach those sermons all over again. Either that or I'm assuming you're shy. They finally leave Philippi. So long. They preached the word of God. They met Lydia down by the river. They encountered the jailer. They brought him to faith. They shared the gospel with the people of the city. They were arrested. They were beaten. They were thrown into prison. Their feet were placed into the stocks. The earthquake came. The jail doors were rattled open. The shackles fell off. The jailer comes. You know the story. He grabs his sword. He pulls it out. He's going to kill himself, right? He's going to plunge that sword home. And Paul yells out from the darkness, Don't do it! Stop! Do not harm yourself. I got to, yeah, thank you. Need all the help I can get. Don't do it. We are all here. I love that. I love that. We are all here. The jailer comes, he trembles. What must I do to be saved? Paul tells him about Jesus Christ. The jailer is baptized with his entire household. The magistrates, the rod bearers, remember them last week? The rod bearers come. Hey, you can go. Get out of town. And Paul and Silas, uh-uh. The people that did this to us, they have to come down to the jail and escort us out. Why? So that the people of the town will see the magistrates made a mistake. They judged these men unjustly. Paul and Silas, they knew if they got up and ran away, the Christians, that brand new church in Philippi, they would be in danger. They would suffer persecution. They might even fall away from the faith. I'm a Roman citizen and you punished me without trial. That's against the law. You're going to get into some hot water. And so the magistrates come. They take them outside. They issue an apology. Hey, can you guys just leave? Would you mind just easing on down the road? They don't kick them out, okay? They don't grab them and take them to the city gates and throw them down on the dirt and say, get the out like the old western movies you've got till Sunday to get out or sundown to get out of town hey can you guys just ease on down the road 
Paul and Silas, they go back to Lydia's house. They encourage the brethren and they leave Luke behind. Luke stays in Philippi to continue to minister to that little house church congregation that is meeting there in Lydia's house. And so now notice how the narration changes. It changes from we to they. Paul and Silas and Timothy, they start walking. And where are they going? The capital of Macedonia. That's where they're heading. Do you know that, that uh, Thessalonica still exists to this day? Only it's not pronounced Thessalonica today. It's pronounced Thess Thessaloniki. Thessaloniki is the same sound, the same city, the, the same location. That's still there 2,000 years later. You know, I always get kind of tickled when we talk about age in America when it comes to historic sites and historic buildings. I live in a house that's 50 years old. It's ancient. There probably weren't even people around that long ago. You go to the Holy Land, you go to Rome, you have buildings that are thousands of years old. Imagine that. Imagine that. Buildings that have been there for not decades, not centuries, but millennia. Okay, you could go there today and walk the very same streets that Paul and Silas walked on. That blows my mind. That blows my mind. What do they see? They get to Thessalonica and they walk around town. Hey, we're in the capital. I mean, think about walking to Tallahassee, right? Capital of the great state of Florida. All right, imagine you walk all the way up there and you're walking around town. What are you going to look for when you get there? You're a good missouri scented Lutheran and it's Sunday. What are you going to try and find? A missouri scented Lutheran church, of course. Yeah, you're going to maybe open the phone book or get on that handheld computer that so many people have today. Maybe sit down with your laptop, do a little Google search. You're going to find Happy Bottom Lutheran Church, home of the short sermon. Yeah, you'll run there, right? There, hey, by the way, there is no Happy Bottom Lutheran Church. You, know, you can try, but I doubt it's out there. Paul and Silas, they're Romans, okay? But they're also Jews, okay? They're Jews. They're Jewish believers. And so what's the first thing they look for when they get to Thessalonica? They look for a synagogue. Look for a synagogue. And according to what Dr. Luke tells us, they get to town, they look around, they find a synagogue. What does that tell you about the city of Thessalonica? Almost sounds like a tongue twister, doesn't it? Thessalonica. Say that three times fast. Thessalonica, Thessalonica, Thessalonica. What does that tell you? How many people does it take? How many men does it take to establish a synagogue? We talked about that when we talked about Philippi because there was no synagogue in Philippi. Ten men. Right. Who said it? Hooray. Good. Gold star for you. Ten men. That tells me there is a Jewish population in Thessalonica. Paul and Silas, they go there. Now, you'll remember this. Whenever you go to a synagogue in the day of Paul, a synagogue is not a temple. There are no sacrifices. There are no services per se. You know, the sacrificial system is limited to the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, that's the reason no sacrifices have been made for Jewish people since 70 AD when the Roman general Titus laid siege to the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the city, destroyed the temple, literally tore one stone down upon another. The temple is totally and completely obliterated Obliterated, which fulfills the prophecy of who? Thank you, Jesus. See how easy it is? Yeah. See how easy it is? Disciples are walking around town. They're checking everything out. It's like the first time they're in New York City. They're looking at all the big buildings. They're the typical tourists. Wow, look at these buildings, they say. This is magnificent. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left upon another. That prophecy comes true. See how Jesus is prophet, priest, and king? All right? 
70 AD. Actually, it started in 66 AD. They laid siege to the city. They breached the city walls in 70, and they tore everything down. Now you have synagogues. And synagogues literally are places of study. Okay, you get together and you get into the Word of God. You get into the Old Testament scriptures and you study and you memorize and you are quizzed and you ask questions and you give answers and there are lectures, okay? Anybody who was a Jewish believer could speak at a synagogue. How many people want to preach a sermon today? Raise your hand. I'll step aside. Anybody got a good sermon brewing in them right now? Preferably a short one. I don't see anybody's hand raised. They say everybody's got a, at least one good sermon. Paul and Silas, they go into the synagogue. Hey, we'd like to talk today. And notice what happens. They go in. They open the scriptures. They start with Genesis 3.15. The Proto-Evangelium, the first proclamation of the gospel. I will send my son, the wounded victor. And they go through the entire Old Testament. There are 322 prophecies in the Old Testament. And Christ fulfilled every single one of them of those prophecies and you think wow that was a really long sermon to go all the way from Genesis to the very last book in the Old Testament which is Malachi yeah if you're Italian Malachi 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 it took Paul three weeks three weeks for three weeks he would go in and talk to the people. And you know what word really jumped out at me as I was researching this section of God's word? Because it has, it, it's translated differently in different translations. You get to Luke, you get to Acts chapter 17, all right, and you're reading all about, you know, there they are in the synagogues, and some translations say, and Paul reasoned with them. Okay. And Paul persuaded them. Okay. And Paul debated with them. No. And Paul argued with them. No. Literally, the word is translated into English, dialogue. Dialogue. That just jumped right out at me. Dialogue, dialogue. What mental picture do you get when you think of the word argue? Something confrontational. I know people that are non-confrontational, that you get into an argument with them over Coke and Pepsi or Chevy or Ford. And they'll, you know, hey, I don't want to talk about it. You know, it's making me uncomfortable. I'm out of here, all right? I don't want to argue with you. Do you know people like that? Or maybe you're like that yourself. Do you know anybody that loves to argue? I was like that growing up. All right, my dad used to tell me, Glenn, you would argue with a fence post. Some people are argumentative. What about debate? What about debate? Did anybody take debate when you were in high school? You took speech class, and part of the speech class, yeah, you had to get into a debate, and you chose a topic, and they chose one side, and you chose the other, and you got up in front of the class, and you stood there at the podium, and you presented their side, and they presented yours, and you went back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, and whoever spoke the loudest won. Is that what Paul did? Not according to what Luke tells us. He dialogued with them. He dialogued with them. And it took him three weeks. Three, you know what that tells me? That one little word, dialogue, tells me that we are so incredibly wrong when it comes to evangelism. Because what do we do? We argue, get into some kind of a debate. 
We meet somebody and they say, you know what, I do not believe in the Bible. I do not believe in the Word of God. I believe that the world was created through an evolutionary cycle and we get out all our ammunition and we start firing at them. Well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And what about this? Or somebody says, you know what, I... I don't believe the Bible is inspired. I believe that it's encapsulated in its own time that when Paul was talking about certain things, he was talking to the people of his day and those things no longer apply to us. And so we debate and out yet again comes all the ammunition. Well, this is what I think and this is what I believe and this is what I will do. And you're wrong. And if you're wrong, I must be right. Well, we only do it one time. I remember years ago, I got into the Kennedy Dialogue Evangelism. Does anybody remember that? The Kennedy Dialogue, you know, where you would ask the two questions. You would go, you'd knock on the door. The people hopefully would invite you inside. You sat down, you asked the question, if you were to die tonight, are you certain and sure that you would go to heaven? And you would wait for them to answer, and you were hoping that they were wrong. Because then you would be right. You get to glow. They answered, yes, certain and sure that I'll go to heaven. Well, why do you think that you'll go to heaven? Well, because I've been a good person my whole life. Ha ha, wrong! Let me tell you about Jesus. That's not what Paul did. That is not the way Paul did it. If you dialogue with someone, what do you do? You speak and you listen. And you speak and you listen. And you speak and you listen. And it takes time. Once again, the whole evangelism program that we have practiced for decades. We go to a door of a total stranger and we knock on that door and, Hi, I'm so-and-so from this certain church and I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. And we give them a little pamphlet. Maybe we have a little spiel and it takes all of five minutes and then we move on and we never see that person again and we think, What? I failed! Paul didn't do that. Paul didn't simply go to the synagogue and hand out pamphlets and say, I'm on to the next town. He stayed. He talked. And I have to believe he would go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, which is Saturday, and then during the week I simply have to believe that there were people who were members of that synagogue who came and talked to him. Paul, you know what, man? You were talking about this thing Saturday and it, it really pe- I, I need to learn more. Can you show me where that is in the Bible? Well, yes, I certainly can. Let's open it up and look and read and see what it says. How many of us feel that we have failed or that we are ineffective in talking about Jesus? I dare say if we follow the five-minute example, that's contrary to the Word of God. I find nowhere in the Bible where somebody had a little chat with somebody who immediately came to faith. What I find are dialogue conversations throughout the New Testament. Remember Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8? The Holy Spirit tells Philip, get on the Gaza Road. I mean, how would you feel if the Holy Spirit came to you and said, start walking down the side of Highway 19. I've got a special surprise for you. Would you do it? Philip did. Got on the Gaza Road. This chariot's going down the road, and the guy sitting in the chariot, what is he doing? He's reading the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 53, and Philip runs up alongside of him, which tells me that Philip was in incredibly good shape. Hey, do you understand what you're reading? So not only is he running, he's able to talk at the same time. How can I unless somebody dialogues with me? Who are you going to dialogue with? 
Who are you going to sit down and have a conversation with? You're not a total stranger. You know, imagine this. Imagine you go over to Walmart and you're walking down the aisle or maybe you go to Target, all right, or Publix or whatever store you visit and you, you see a total stranger coming toward you. Hey, how's your spleen? That'd be a little awkward. But if you know that person and you know they're having a little trouble and you call them up on the phone, hey, I hear you had a doctor's appointment, is everything okay? And they can tell you the whole story. You bond, you relate, you share love, you share support. You might even pray with or for that person and it's totally, totally acceptable. That's the way it is with the message of Christ. Imagine if I was walking down the aisle in Target. Are you going to go to hell? I know you're not, Mickey. I know you're not. <laughs> it, it'd be a little weird, wouldn't it? You know? But if you got somebody that you know, somebody that you love, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, old army buddy, a high school friend, whoever it is, you know them. Have you ever asked them about their salvation? Have you ever dialogued with them about Jesus Christ? And it takes time. It takes time. I'll tell you this story and then we're done. There's hope. <laughs> My grandfather was a Lutheran pastor, Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor, the very first Lutheran pastor in the great state of Florida. He graduated from the seminary in 1894 and they said gay and see. And to Florida he came. He came to Ocala and he traveled all over the state of Florida and established what they call preaching stations. He would show up in a town. He, hey, I'm going to do a church service this Sunday. And he would preach. He would baptize. He would marry. He would confirm. He, he was, you know, a circuit rider, all right? A circuit rider from town to town, village to village. Finally settles in the beautiful little town of Gotha, G-O-T-H-A. Some people mistakenly call it Gotha. It's Gotha, okay? My grandfather, a Lutheran pastor, a faithful Lutheran pastor for 61 years. And there was a man who lived in Gotha by the name of Adam Mize, M-I-Z-E. Adam Mize, a big man, big burly bear of a man. And when I was in church, when I was a little boy, Adam Mize would always sit behind us. He had this real deep voice and he would sing, you know, and he was a great big fella. And uh, he was in church every Sunday. If the church needed something, you know, he was kind of a handyman, he would fix it. If they needed workers to work in the men's club, Adam Mize would show up. A strong supporter of Zion Lutheran Church. And one day when I was in my 20s, I was talking to my dad about that. Wow, Adam's there every, every single Sunday. And my dad said, you know what? When my father moved to Gotha, Adam would not come to church. He had no church affiliation whatsoever. He rejected religion. And my grandfather worked on him, worked is a hard word, dialogued with him for 25 years. A quarter of a century. Think about that. He never gave up. Anytime he saw Mr. Mize, hey, Mr. Mize, and they would talk. And they'd build a relationship. And they would talk about faith and God and eternity and forgiveness. Twenty-five years. To the point that Adam Mize came to faith, accepted Christ, became a member of Zion Lutheran Church. And I guarantee you right now, Adam Mize is with Christ in heaven. Who do you need to dialogue with? Who do you need to sit down with and chat? Not argue, not debate, not get mad, not get offended, not get defeated, not give up. 
who in your life do you need to talk to? That, my friends, is a very good question. And all God's people say, Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The congregation